Hey there, welcome to another Path of Exile guide, this time with the Lacerate Gladiator. While there are quite a few such builds floating around, this is my personal take on it and the goal was to make a near unkillable character that would easily clear all content. The build will be rated on 5 different categories. Defense and survivability, mapping and clearing speed, bossing and single target damage, cost and viability as a league starter. Starting off with its tanking abilities, this will likely be one of the most resilient characters you've ever played. To achieve this I went with a sword and board setup, except we're actually using an axe but axe and board doesn't really sound as good. Anyway, while you could definitely squeeze out more damage by dual wielding instead, it's almost impossible to die when playing the build using a shield. You combined cap block chance for both attacks and spells, incredible physical damage reduction, permanently blinded enemies missing half their attacks against you, generous life leech and even the option of regaining life when blocking. Highly mobile and leveraging on the Gladiator Ascendancy Corpse Explosion ability, clearing maps is a breeze. However, unless you run very high density maps, don't expect to clear entire screens with a single hit. Lacerate is still technically a melee skill, so it cannot match the coverage of most spells or bow abilities. And speaking of maps, you can run all map modes except Physical Damage Reflect, which would kill you quite quickly. As for bossing, well, single target damage is not exactly your strongest suit. While that's not to say you'll hit them like a wet noodle, you won't instantly melt bosses either. Most of your damage will come from piling up bleed stacks and, as with any other damage over time mechanic, it takes longer to ramp up to its full potential. On the flip side, bleeding will continue dealing damage even while you're repositioning or dodging various boss fight mechanics, so your true DPS uptime will be significantly higher. As such, I give it 4 dragon heads out of 5. At the end of the video there's a full Awakener 8 Cirrus Deathless fight that should clarify exactly how good the build is at killing bosses. In terms of cost, this is a pretty low budget build without requiring any mandatory uniques. A combination of basic and mid-tier gear will easily get you into red maps territory where you can then start generating currency and upgrade to endgame items. This also makes it a great league starter as you can easily finish story mode and get into atlas farming with self found rare items and a few crafted resistance or damage mods. Before diving into the guide proper, just a reminder if anything is unclear or you have any questions about the build, you can find me streaming on Twitch at twitch.tv slash navandis, link to a schedule in the pinned comment and video description. I'm live 4 or 5 times a week and we'll get to see every upcoming build being put together, leveled up and fine tuned before it becomes a guide such as this one. Finally, the most up to date path of building link will always be found in the pinned comment and video description. As usual, the guide is divided into 7 main sections. Build Overview, Passive Tree and Leveling, Ascendancy, Pantheon, Gems and Links, Gear Flux and Jewels and finally Pros and Cons. So with that out of the way, let's start with the Build Overview. The build's main skill, Lacerate, fires two waves, one slightly to the left, the other to the right, each damaging all enemies in a cone-shaped area. These two waves overlap in the middle, so any enemy caught in that zone will be hit by both. This allows the skill to perform great both as a clearing ability as well as a single target one without needing to swap any gems. By default Lacerate has a 25% chance to cause bleeding and drastically increases bleed damage as well and this will be the build's main focus. Bleeding is an ailment that deals physical damage over time and by default only stacks once on each target. In addition, moving targets suffer greatly increased bleeding damage. However, in this build we'll trade the extra damage for moving for the ability of inflicting up to 8 bleed stacks on each enemy through the Crimson Dance Keystone. This passive also reduces the damage you deal with bleeding by 50% so you need to have at least 2 bleed stacks on an enemy to compensate for that. Any additional stack after that is a pure damage bonus provided by Crimson Dance up to 200% more. So the logic behind choosing this keystone is rather simple, it's a net DPS increase against any target that takes more than 2 hits to die, and that means bosses and other tough rare monsters which was exactly Lacerate's weakness. The next piece of the puzzle is ensuring we actually get to apply that maximum of 8 bleed stacks as quickly as possible and this is done by gathering a lot of attack speed through passives and items. If a target already has 8 bleed stacks on them, additional bleeds will always overwrite the weakest existing ones. This means at any point you'll always have the strongest bleeds ticking away on each target. Bleed damage is based on the physical damage of the attack that caused it, so a higher initial hit with lacerate means a stronger bleed attack. 
We further capitalize on this mechanic by using Ruthless Support, which says every third hit you'll deal a Ruthless Blow with 132% more damage. So after 24 hits, your target will have 8 bleed stacks caused by Ruthless Blows dealing an insane amount of damage. Now that might seem like a tall order, but you'll actually end up with somewhere around 5 or 6 attacks per second. On the defense front, you're an unstoppable juggernaut. 75% chance to block both spells and attacks, 80% plus physical damage reduction, additional layers of mitigation and damage absorption in the form of fortify, endurance charges, molten shell and so on. While it sounds like a lot to take in, don't worry, as usual, I'll talk more about these in the passives, gems and gearing sections respectively. And speaking of that, let's actually start with the passive tree and leveling. You start off as a duelist and there are two different passive trees, one using cluster jewels and one without. These are a special type of jewel expanding the existing tree with additional new passives. For this build, the cluster jewel version has about 20% more DPS but slightly weaker defenses. However, the jewels themselves will cost some extra currency so you can decide which option is better for you depending on your budget as well. Both variants are found in the path of building guide linked in the video description and pinned comment. In both cases, the top priority is to get 100% chance to cause bleeding and that's easily done through a few minor passives in the bloodletting, red storm and cleaving wheels. These will also provide a lot of DPS in the form of damage over time multiplier for bleeding, increased physical damage with axes or axe attacks deal increased damage with ailments. While in the beginning you can use any one-handed weapon type, once you start picking up axe specific passives, it's obviously time to switch to axes. Similarly with shields, at first you can even dual wield, but after picking up retaliation or aggressive bastion, it's definitely worth equipping a shield. On the defense front, we're stacking a shit ton of life through passives such as Bravery, Golem's Blood, Bloodless, Juggernaut, Heart of the Warrior, etc. Most of these also net you a large amount of armor, making you incredibly resilient against physical damage. Chance to block is another important defensive layer, and this side of the tree has quite a few nodes providing this stat. Aggressive Bastion, Defiance or Solidity are prime examples for this. Finally, there are three important keystones you'll pick up in both versions of the tree. Crimson Dance, Call to Arms and Resolute Technique. I've already covered the first one extensively in the Build Overview section, so check that out if you skipped it. Call to Arms allows you to instantly cast a Warcry, and for this build I chose Enduring Cry. It provides a huge life regen burst heal as well as endurance charges, further reducing the physical damage you take. As for Resolute Technique, with this passive you'll never miss any attack and that's without investing anything into accuracy, but you'll also never deal critical strikes. Since we don't have the passive points to go full crit, this is a decent trade-off as you no longer need to get any accuracy on your gear. This frees up a lot of item affixes which can be used instead for attack speed, flat physical damage or defenses. Now let's talk a bit about the cluster jewels part of the tree. First you have a large cluster jewel and the most important passive you're looking for is wound aggravation, by far the largest DPS boost of all the available options. The other two passives can be any combination of the following. Heavy Hitter, Fuel the Fight, Devastator, Smite the Weak, Martial Prowess or Feed the Fury. All these are pretty much similar in terms of damage output, so you have quite a bit of flexibility when looking to buy or craft the large cluster jewel. On medium cluster jewels, wound aggravation is once more the best choice. As for the second passive, you can go with either pure damage or a hybrid between damage and defense. The best DPS passives are Vivid Hues, Rend or Compound Injury, while good examples of hybrid ones are Flow of Life, Exposure Therapy or Brood for Potency. Finally, on the small cluster jewels, the best option is the rather expensive but easy to craft Fetal for a metric ton of extra life. If you can't afford or don't want to bother crafting it, then Peak Vigor, Feast of Flesh or Surge in Vitality are good secondary options. As for the bandits, the choice here is quite simple, kill them all and get the two passive points. Since we're not going crit, pretty much none of the bonuses provided by either of the three bandits are useful for this build. Finally, when it comes to leveling, Lacerate is obtainable as early as level 12, so there shouldn't be too much confusion here. You can start off by using Cleave, Splitting Steel, even Double Strike or Puncture. It makes very little difference as getting to level 12 is really quick and easy, so choose the one you like most. You'll find leveling gem setup in the Path of Building guide linked in the video description and pinned comment. And that's about it for the passive tree and leveling. In the next section I'll be covering the Ascendancy class, which improves pretty much every single aspect of this build. 
The Gladiator Ascendancy is almost synonym with a sword and board playstyle in Path of Exile, so it's the best choice for this build as well. First points go into Blood in the Eyes, a great 2-in-1 offensive and defensive passive. It greatly boosts your chance to apply bleeding and maims enemies, slowing them down and causing them to take increased physical damage. On top of that, you get a decent chance to blind bleeding enemies, drastically reducing their accuracy against you. After completing Crew Labyrinth, follow up with Gratuitous Violence. You get even more chance to apply bleeding and increases your overall bleed damage by a large margin. But more importantly, bleeding enemies you kill explode, dealing 10% of their maximum life as physical damage. This is one of the best and most reliable mass clearing mechanics in the game and will greatly improve your mapping speed and overall efficiency. Once you'll get this passive, you'll wonder how did you play without it until then. Third in line is Painforged, a really solid hybrid passive. Your chance to block is substantially increased if you are damaged recently, or alternatively, your own damage is increased if you haven't taken any damage in the past 4 seconds. Blocking a hit completely nullifies its damage, so with a very high chance to block, the extra DPS bonus will be up most of the time. If a mob does manage to hit you, then your chance to block is increased, potentially preventing subsequent hits. In addition, you cannot be stunned by hits you block, yet another great addition to your defensive toolbox. Finally, with the last ascendancy points, take Versatile Combatant, which will make your chance to block spells equal to the chance to block attacks. This might not seem like a huge deal at first, but spell block is actually very hard to get, especially in our side of the passive tree. Moreover, the vast majority of shields only provide a chance to block attacks, but not spells. Simply put, this passive pretty much doubles your average effective HP and will save your ass countless times by blocking boss spells. With the Ascendancy out of the way, we can take a quick look at the Pantheon choices. Generally speaking, Pantheon choices are situational and there isn't a best pair that will outperform all others in any scenario. However, there are certain options that complement specific builds quite well in a wide range of situations. For this particular case, here are my recommendations. For the Major God, Soul of Arakali. Damage over time is a weak spot for this build, so getting some defenses against that is always a good idea. On top of that, it reduces Shock's duration and effectiveness, which is one of the most dangerous ailments out there. Any additional way to shave off extra damage you receive is more than welcome. As for the Minor God, the optimal choice is likely Soul of Shakari. It doubles down on defense against damage over time and chaos damage, the only remaining weaker spots for this build. Having covered the Pantheon choices, we can now focus on one of the most important aspects of any build, Gems and Links. Heist League has introduced alternate qualities for both active skills and support gems. These provide different bonuses than the default versions of the gems and in some cases they might add a bit more damage or utility. While none of these are mandatory, nor do they add a lot of DPS, you'll find the alternate quality gems in the Path of Building Guide 8. Some might be dirt cheap, while some might cost over 50 chaos, so it's up to you if you wish to invest anything into them. With that out of the way, as usual, I'll start off with the main skill, Lacerate and its supports. If possible, try to get a level 21 Lacerate gem through corruption, as this skill gains quite a bit of additional damage from extra levels. Also, support gems are listed in order of their importance, so if you can only get a 5 link, then just drop the last gem I've listed. First, you have Brutality, a staple of pretty much all pure physical damage builds. You get a shitload of extra physical damage, but also prevents Lacerate from dealing any elemental or chaos damage. Since bleeding can only be applied by dealing physical damage, this downside is practically non-existent. Then you have Multi-Strike, which should come as no surprise. With this support, every time you attack with Lacerate, it will be repeated two additional times, dealing more damage each time. Not only that, but you also gain up to 44% more attack speed, making the perfect tool for quickly applying those 8 bleed stacks. Third in line is Ruthless, one of the biggest DPS increases for bleed builds. Every third lacerate hit will be a Ruthless blow, dealing significantly more damage. Since bleed damage is based on the physical damage of the attack that caused it, these Ruthless blows will apply some really massive bleed stacks. Up next is the very simple melee physical damage, a support that just boosts your physical and bleed damage. The name pretty much says it all. Finally, the last gem in your main setup is Fortify. Not only is this a pretty solid DPS support, but it also grants you the buff with the same name, which reduces the damage you take from any hits by 20%. Next we have a couple of auras. First, there's Pride, an aura which increases physical damage taken by your enemies, including bleed damage, the longer they stay inside its radius. 
Then there's Blood and Sand along with its twin aura Flesh and Stone. These auras have two modes or stances, Blood and Sand and you can toggle between them by simply pressing the aura skill button again. Sand stance is a defensive option while Blood focuses more on dealing extra damage. On top of that, the two stances actually influence how Lacerate behaves as well. In Sand Stance, your Lacerate slashes are wider, while in Blood Stance, you'll deal significantly more damage. However, there isn't really much reason to ever use Sand Stance, as your map clear is already strong thanks to the corpse explosions provided by your Ascendancy. So my advice for this build is to stick with Blood Stance and forget Sand even exists. Finally, add War Banner, which also causes nearby enemies to take increased physical damage, pretty similar to Pride Aura. While you could plant the banner in the ground to temporarily boost its effectiveness, the damage increase is marginal, so I wouldn't really bother with that. Just use it as a regular aura and let it do its thing passively. Now, if you haven't yet crafted mana cost reduction affixes on your ring and amulet, then you can temporarily drop War Banner so you have more mana available. You can even replace it with an enlightened support of at least level 2 but ideally level 3 or 4 to reduce the mana reservation cost of your auras. Up next we have your buffs and utility setup. First there's Enduring Cry, a war cry which generates endurance charges, boosts your defenses and provides a huge life regen burst. Then there's Molten Shell, a guard skill which creates a damage absorption shield based on how much armor you have. It will soak up almost 5000 damage when you have your granite flask up. Since both Molten Shell and Enduring Cry are instant cast, you can bind either to your left mouse button, replacing the default move. As you keep the button pressed, it will move your character as usual, but also cast Molten Shell or Enduring Cry on cooldown without interrupting movement. The last active skill in this setup is Blood Rage, which greatly increases your attack speed and life leech, but also applies a physical damage over time debuff on yourself. However, this dot will be entirely offset by your life regen, so you don't really need to worry about it. In addition, killing an enemy while having Blood Rage up refreshes the buff duration and has a chance to give you a frenzy charge. These charges will in turn increase your damage and attack speed even further. Finally, link all these to second wind support to reduce their cooldown. Your mobility setup is made out of Leap Slam, linked with faster attacks and curling strike. Not only will the skill be much quicker, but hitting any enemy at or below 10% HP will instantly kill them. And yes, that applies to bosses as well, including big boys like Cirrus or Shaper. Lastly, add Ancestral Protector. This totem skill is only meant to be used in boss fights and its main selling point is the excellent attack speed buff it provides while you're standing near it. On top of that, it will also benefit from Culling Strike as well and many times a totem will be delivering the killing blow against bosses while you're moving around. Next we have a simple cast when damage taken setup, socketed in your weapon. This trigger gem will cast any linked active skills after you take a certain amount of damage. A higher cast when damage taken gem will be able to cast a higher link gem, but it would also require a lot more damage to be triggered. As such, for this particular setup, we'll keep the trigger gem at level 3. You then link it with a level 7 vulnerability. Since this is a curse you want to have it cast as often as possible and higher levels of the gem would not provide a huge benefit anyway. Last gem in this setup is Tempest Shield. It provides a decent chance to block buff which will refresh every time you block something. Finally, the last setup which should be socketed in your shield is a Repost plus Culling Strike and Maim supports. Repost is a counter attack ability which triggers every time you block but has a 0.8 seconds cooldown. While it deals a decent amount of damage, its real purpose is to cull and maim enemies slowing them down. More importantly however, enemies maimed this way will take increased physical damage from any source including lacerate or bleeding. Moreover, the best in slot shield, the Surrender, comes with its own baked in counter attack skill called Reckoning. This also triggers when you block but on a 0.4 seconds cooldown and it does benefit from support gems socketed in it. With the gems out of the way, it's time to take a look at the recommended gear for this build. In this section, for each gear slot I will outline 3 tiers, basic, mid tier and best in slot. Generally speaking, prices increase significantly with each tier, but so do the benefits that the items bring. The notes tab in the path of building guide contains trade links to help you find and buy the necessary gear. You can tweak the filters according to your budget and character at that time. Your main goal is to cap your elemental resistances and get as much life as possible while equipping as many of the best in slot unique items as possible. The second big priority is to reduce the mana cost for lacerate, which can end up completely free. This is done through minus mana cost mods on rings, amulet and body armor. 
In turn, this will allow you to reserve all your mana with auras, greatly boosting your DPS. Until you manage to reduce Lacerate's cost, you'll need to use an Enduring Mana Flask so you can freely spam your attack. The rest of the item affixes should be dedicated to damage mods, flat physical damage, attack speed, physical damage over time multiplier, and even mods that provide extra levels to your Lacerate gem. Starting from the top, a good basic tier helmet has 60 plus elemental resistances and maximum life, some chaos resistance or decks, ideally on an armor base. A good meteor one is the often overlooked crown of the inward eye. It provides a very large amount of life and armor, as well as some decent damage thanks to transfiguration of body. This passive translates to increases and reductions to maximum life also applied to attack damage at 30% of their value. Finally, for best in slot, you've got the high risk, high reward abysses. It comes with a massive amount of flat physical damage, a huge amount of armor, as well as 20 plus all attributes. However, all these come at a cost, 40 to 50% increase physical damage taken. For most builds, this would be fatal, but with endurance charges and a huge amount of armor, you'll actually still be incredibly tanky and won't really feel this penalty. Still, look for one with at most 42 or 43 increase physical damage taken. Moving on to your weapon, you'll be using a one-handed axe, and a good basic tier 1 should have some attack speed and some physical damage, everything amounting to 300 plus physical DPS. Since you're using brutality support, elemental or chaos damage on your weapon is completely useless, so only look for pure physical damage axes. For me tier, pretty much the same affixes but with higher numeric values, so looking at at least 350 physical DPS. In addition, mods such as increased damage with bleeding, damage over time multiplier or increased area damage are more than welcome. Finally, for best in slot, the absolute strongest affix you're looking for is 60% chance for bleeding inflicted with this weapon to deal 100% more damage, which can roll on high item level elder influenced axes. Pair this with 300 plus physical DPS and you'll end up with more damage than a 400 DPS axe without this mod. While such weapons can be rather expensive, you can try crafting one yourself using alteration plus augmentation plus regal orbs. If you're not really familiar with crafting, check out my basic crafting guide by clicking on that I think in the upper right corner. In your offhand, a basic tier shield should have 80 plus life, 70 plus total resistances, 500 plus armor and at least 25% chance to block. As a mid-tier upgrade, the unique lionized remorse is the perfect choice. While you lose resistances, it comes with a metric ton of life and armor instead. The best in slot shield for this build is the amazing The Surrender unique, which can be obtained from the breach boss Ulnetol. While it has slightly less life than Lion Eyes, you get a massive 250 life heal each time you block, as well as 1500 armor if you've blocked in the past 4 seconds. With 75% chance to block, it's safe to say you'll constantly benefit from both bonuses. On top of that, the shield grants the Reckoning counter-attack skill which triggers automatically when you block. So getting the repost set up in it will have Reckoning, benefit from maim and culling strike supports as well. Up next is the body armor and this is mostly a defensive slot. At basic tier, you need at least 5 links, 70 plus life and 70 plus elemental resistances. Some extra chaos resistance or decks would also be a great bonus. For mid tier, you should already aim for 6 links and the best candidate is either a rare armor, similar to the basic tier 1, or a belly of the beast unique with its massive 30-40% increased maximum life. Finally, for best in slot, an ideal one should have 90 plus life, 70 plus total resistances, over 1k armor and the warlord specific suffix, socketed attacks have minus 15 to total mana cost. With this, Lacerate's mana cost will drop significantly and will enable you to reserve more mana with auras which increase your damage. Moving on to gloves, Hemophilia is an excellent basic tier item, increasing your damage against bleeding targets and causing them to explode on death. And this corpse explosion actually does stack with the one granted by Gratuitous Violence passive from the Ascendancy. For mid tier and best in slot, look for a pair of rare gloves with 60 plus life along with some flat physical damage and attack speed. If you still need them, try to squeeze in some resistances. Some additional great but expensive mods you can look for on top of these are chance to intimidate on hit, physical damage over time multiplier or increased damage with bleeding. These can be found on Elder, Hunter or Warlord influenced items. Moving on to boots, an excellent pair of basic ones are the unique Red Blade Tramplers. Movement speed, some life, a bit of resistance and solid amount of armor. But the real selling point is the added flat physical damage, an affix that is not normally found on boots. 
Meteor 1 should have at least 25% movement speed, 70 plus life and 80 plus resistances. An armor or hybrid armor plus evasion base is ideal. Finally, best in slot boots need pretty much the same affixes but with higher numeric values and ideally 30 plus decks to gather enough for green gems such as Blood Rage or Repost. Up next is your belt slot and a basic one should come with about 90 plus life, elemental resistances and maybe even some chaos res. A rustic sash base is ideal for its increased physical damage implicit. For mid tier replace the base with a stygian vice for the extra jewel socket. If your elemental resistances are already capped then look for some chaos resistance instead as well as some flask related affixes. And for best in slot the unique Rislatha coil is pretty much unbeatable for bleed builds. What this belt does is widen your damage range, so if for example you're normally rolling between 50 to 100 damage, with this belt you'll now roll between 25 to 125 damage. Since stronger bleed stacks replace weaker ones, increasing your top end damage range directly translates into more bleed damage. Ideally, you should look for Ritzlatas with the lowest roll for the less minimum physical attack damage mode and the highest roll for the more maximum physical attack damage. A perfectly rolled belt would have 30% less minimum physical damage and 40% more max fizz damage. While such a belt would be insanely expensive, you can use divine orbs to get as close to this as possible. Finally, make sure you apply abrasive catalysts on this belt to further increase its damage bonus. The amulet is a versatile slot in this build and it should be used to squeeze out as much damage as possible while having just enough resistances to be capped. On basic amulets look for flat added physical damage, a good amount of life and some elemental resistances. Ideally on a turquoise or citrine base so you can squeeze out some extra decks from the implicit. On mid tier and best in slot amulets a crucial prefix is non channeling skills have minus mana cost. Between amulet and rings you'll need the minus mana cost prefix on two of these accessories. This will get your lacerate to only cost one or two mana points allowing you to spam it without needing a mana flask. This mod is crafted using your hideout bench and is unlocked by unveiling jewelry dropped by Elrion in Syndicate Encounters. In addition to that look for flat physical damage, a good amount of life and perhaps some resistances if you're not yet capped. If you don't need additional resistances then a mod such as physical damage over time multiplier or plus one to level of all dexterity gems will greatly boost your DPS. Amulets can also be anointed using oils dropped from blight encounters to add a notable passive to them without changing the item in any other way. For this build my top recommendation is Command of Steel which provides increased damage proportional to your chance to block. It's also really cheap so there's no reason to go with any other passive. If for whatever reason you can't get the necessary oils then Harvester of Foes is a decent, somewhat more affordable alternative. With rings it's the same story as with the amulet, get as much dps as possible while using just enough affixes for capping your resistances. Then regardless of tier the priority is still getting a total of two non channeling skills have minus mana cost prefixes between your rings and amulet. Besides that on basic ones look for 40 plus maximum life just enough resistances to be capped along with some flat physical damage. Mid tier and best in slot ones should have pretty much the same affixes, just higher numeric values as well as some extra attack speed, chaos resistance or dex. While in the past chaos resistance was more of a luxury thing to have, nowadays the game throws more and more chaos damage at you so it becomes rather important to mitigate some of that. Up next are jewels and while you'll only have 2 or 3 sockets they can be an excellent source of dps, life and utility. On regular jewels you're looking for maximum or flat life, flat physical damage, attack speed, increased damage with bleeding or physical damage over time multiplier. The damage modes can come in a variety of formats with axes while holding a shield with one handed weapons etc. I can't list them all here but you can find trade links in the notes tab of the path of building guide. There's also a very good unique jewel which although somewhat expensive will really push your dps to the next level. A watcher's eye with an affix chance to deal double damage while using pride. As for cluster jewels I've already talked about the passives you're looking for in the passive tree section so check that out if you skipped it. Here I'll just mention the overall structure of the cluster jewels. The large one should have maximum 9 passives, 3 significant ones, 2 jewel sockets and 3 or 4 minor. The medium cluster jewels should have maximum 5 passives, 2 significant ones, 1 jewel socket and 1 or 2 minor passives. Finally the small cluster jewel can have 2 or 3 passives, one being the mandatory significant. If the cluster jewels have more total passives than what I've listed you'll be wasting more points than necessary. 
Moving on to flasks, these are quite an important component of this build and they will greatly boost your overall damage and defenses. First you need a Seething Divine Life Flask of Staunching. Instant healing is a real lifesaver and bleeding remover is absolutely mandatory while mapping. Second is an Experimenter Quartz Flask. The additional chance to dodge both spells and attacks is a solid defensive layer on top of stuff like block or armor. The suffix should be of heat for chill and freeze immunity. Third flask is a chemist quicksilver flask of adrenaline. Movement speed directly affects your efficiency and map clearing potential and this in turn translates to a higher rate of generating currency. Fourth one is Lion's Roar Unique Flask. This provides a massive amount of extra physical damage as well as a 3000 armor bonus so it fits perfectly with this build. And for the last one, if you haven't yet gotten minus mana cost affixes on your body armor and jewelry then you definitely need an enduring eternal mana flask. Enduring affix means the effect doesn't end when your mana is full, providing constant regeneration without needing to time your flask usage. If you don't mind having to constantly use a mana flask, then this can even be your endgame setup, giving you more flexibility when it comes to your rings and amulet. Just be careful in prolonged boss fights. On the other hand, if your lacerate cost is down to 1 or 2 mana, then you can use a chemist server flask instead for some nice damage and life regen bonuses. On either of these, the suffix has to be of warding for curse immunity. Curses are encountered really often while mapping and they can be crippling, greatly reducing your defenses or damage output. Now to wrap up the gearing section, here are some excellent leveling uniques which will help you easily progress to the campaign. With the gearing out of the way, it's time to take a final look at the pros and cons of the build so you can understand if it's what you're looking for. Starting off with the pros, an excellent league starter, it's very cheap to gear up for the first few tiers of mapping and this will help you generate currency quick and get a head start. A really mobile and fast paced build, you just leap around and one tap most enemies you encounter. Incredible defenses, you're almost immortal unless you really mess something up. Excellent clearing speed, the build is very efficient at quickly killing large packs of mobs without any downtime. Very easy to play without complicated mechanics or complex gearing, definitely beginner friendly. Really fun build, I know this is an often overlooked aspect in Path of Exile, but it's always great to play a build that just feels right. As for the cons, single target damage is not stellar. While you won't have issues killing all the existing bosses, it will take a bit longer than other super heavy DPS builds. Cannot run physical reflect maps, still this is less of a problem nowadays since there's a sextant mod which grants immunity to reflected damage. Damage scaling is somewhat limited and there aren't too many options to push the damage much further than this. I will now leave you with a full Awakener 8 fight to get a taste of what endgame boss fighting looks like with this build.
Learn anything new, Exile? If you did, then you'll probably be happy to hear there are more videos coming up in the near future with more exciting builds to try. Make sure not to miss them by subscribing to the channel so you get notified when that happens. And while you're at it, why not like this video as well or drop a comment down below to let me know your thoughts. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.